is it just me or is this a very strange time of the year? I mean, it always feels like to me that the year should have ended with Christmas, and yet here we are with several days in between until we get to New Year's Day, and even then, the new year doesn't quite start until we all get back to our regular daily lives, sometimes around January 5th. It is a liminal time, an in-between time, a time where it's still dark for more hours and we are reminded that like it or not, change, it will come. A year closes out and a new one springs forth and sometimes in this liminal space each year, maybe we're a little more open to change, more willing even to initiate it. So. How many of you plan to make New Year's resolutions or have made them in the past? It's not a rhetorical question, raise your hand. <laughs> now, how many of you have made such a resolution and broken it within a few weeks or months? My hand goes way up, so. Because change can be difficult. Old habits can be cantankerous. And this is true not just for us as individuals, but also for families groups and institutions and churches. Sometimes we just don't like change and we don't always even know why or even realize that we're resisting it. Haven't you ever heard someone when someone else was trying to make a change, even if it might be for the better, haven't you ever heard someone say, but that's the way we've always done it? Have you ever said it yourself or maybe at least thought it? My hand goes way up again. And yet, as I said, change will come. This morning, there are likely many folks here who are going through some sort of change in their lives. Others may be thinking about initiating some sort of change. Our world around us is both changing rapidly and in need of changes that would bring about more justice, more equity, more compassion, Often our church is the resource we look to to help motivate and sustain us during such times, and yet the church is ever-changing also. Our voting membership this month included 621 people. That's a growth of about 200 folks in about three years. That's a lot of change. If we add to that the folks who are involved in some way with this religious community but don't meet the requirements for voting, a little more difficult to quantify, but I think it would mean that the rate of change would be even higher. On top of that, we just completed a successful $3 million capital campaign. And all of this is great. It means that we're living out that mission that we put on our wall and we say together every Sunday and it also means that our building and facilities will change and some of the ways that we do things will likely have to be adjusted along with it. At some point, we'll be dealing with construction and all of the disruption that goes with that for a while. And if any of you are sitting there feeling a little nervous or queasy about all that, that's okay, that's human. I feel that way sometimes too. So this morning, since we're in that liminal space, that in-between space in so many different ways, I thought I'd share with you some, some ways of thinking about change, even of finding spirituality within uncertainty, which I have found particularly helpful. One of the things that they taught us in seminary that I found helpful is that it turns out that there may be some truth to that old adage that we can sometimes struggle more with change as we grow older. Until sometime in our 30s, our brains are highly malleable. We easily lay down the neural pathways that will allow us to learn and to adjust to change. As we age, though, we can start to lose some of this neuroplasticity, as it's called. That's why, for instance, as we get older, we may have more trouble adjusting to changing or moving to a new residence because our brains keep looking for our stuff where it was at the place where we used to live. Now, losing some of this neuroplasticity is not entirely a bad thing. Laying down all those neural pathways uses a lot of energy that the body could use for other purposes otherwise. And it doesn't mean there's no hope for those of us who may be a bit past our 30s. It just means we find ourselves a little more challenged when we run into new life situations. 
And it turns out that challenging ourselves by intentionally experiencing difference through some of the ways we often talk about here at church can be helpful. Multicultural interactions, travel, varied forms of music, meditation, ritual, and other spiritual practices can help keep our brains more open to change as we age. And even for folks in their 30s or younger, these types of spirit experiences can also help because they build up a sort of plasticity reserve, so to speak, that will be there as they grow older. Now, the science is a lot more complicated than that summary I just gave you, and the research is ongoing, so our understanding of how the brain functions is changing at a rapid pace. The church is offering a five-session adult faith formation course on just this subject starting next Sunday, so I encourage you to attend. It's fascinating stuff, and then you can come back later and tell me what I just got wrong. So, There's a book called Switch, How to Change Things When Change is Hard, and it borrows this metaphor for how our brain works from psychologist Jonathan Haidt, and then it uses that metaphor to develop some really useful on advice on how to deal with change. In this metaphor, the rational part of our brain, the part that uses reason, is pictured as a small rider sitting atop this giant elephant. Now, the elephant is the emotional part of our brain. It's the part that contains our innate desires and our survival instincts. The problem when it comes to change is that we tend to rely too heavily on the rider. We think we can use our reason, the rider, much more so than is actually possible. But the problem is the elephant is so much longer and so, larger and so much stronger than the rider that when the elephant wants to go in a different way, the rider can only keep it going in the reasonable direction for so long. The rider wears out. The elephant takes over. Now the book says that to create change, we can do three things. Direct the rider motivate the elephant, and shape the path. My favorite example they give is of Clocky. This is an invention by an MIT student. Clocky is an alarm clock with wheels, and it's designed to address that scenario where our alarm clock goes off and our elephant really wants to stay under those nice warm covers and keep snoozing. And then our rider doesn't help at all because it uses our reason to rationalize hitting that snooze button or turning the alarm off by thinking things like, I can sleep a few more minutes if I just skip breakfast, or I don't have to go to church this morning, Meg's not preaching anyway. <laughs> Clocky short circuits this process by rolling off the nightstand when the alarm goes off and proceeding to scurry around the bedroom floor, alarm still blaring. <laughs> now what Clocky has done is let us direct the rider, right? Because we've been able to set up the scenario ahead of time before we snuggle down under those covers and the next morning it leaves us no other logical choice except to get out of bed, capture the thing, and shut it off. It motivates the elephant by being so darned annoying that it overrides that strong desire to keep sleeping. And it shapes the path because, well, now that we've already gotten up to shut the darn thing off, we might as well stay up and get ready for work. Now, I have to admit that my elephant would be tempted to stomp Clocky into a gazillion pieces. So I won't be purchasing one, but hopefully you get the idea anyway. Another book, Leadership on the Line, Staying Alive Through the Dangers of Leading, adds what I think is a really important conceptual framework by distinguishing between technical change and adaptive change. Now, technical changes are things like changing the technologies, the computers, the softwares that we use, that sort of thing, changing our policies and procedures. This is usually stuff where there's a knowledge base that exists already to help us make the change. Adaptive changes, on the other hand, involve changing how we do things at a much more fundamental level. They require examining our values and our purpose. They require experimenting and learning. Now the problem is we have a tendency to concentrate on the more tangible stuff that is technical change and do that at the expense of adaptive change. The problem is that adaptive change is harder, but it's often what is needed more. Oftentimes we need a little of both. When I was 
thinking about how to give you an example of these types of changes, it occurred to me that what's happened in this church over the last few years is actually a great example of people doing both sorts of change. In the couple of years leading up to the church calling Meg Barnhouse as senior minister, the interim ministers and the church leadership work with the congregation and put into place a new form of governance and the structures and policies and procedures needed to make that form of governance work. They also work with the church to put together a covenant of healthy relations and to discern our values and our mission. Now, the establishing and writing all of, of all of this involved a good deal of technical work. However, it also began the adaptive work because we had to think about our values, our purpose, how we wanted to be together as a religious community. And then Meg and the church leadership expanded the adaptive work by making that mission central to our decision-making in the church and in all of our activities, and by creating a culture of mutual accountability and covenantal relationship. Leadership on the line also points out something else important about change. We so often talk about how people are resistant to change itself. What the book points out is that we can have more empathy, we can have more understanding even for ourselves when we realize what we're really resisting is loss. There is always loss involved in change. If you think about it, any transformative change, any creative act involves the destruction of something that exists in order to create something new. And this, this is closely related to a way of viewing the world that, for me, has fundamentally altered the way that I view change. It's called process relational philosophy or process relational theology when applied to religion. Now, process thought grew out of the philosophical work of a British mathematician named Alfred North Whitehead. Later, others, including Charles Hartshorn, a professor at the University of Texas here in Austin and a longtime member of this church, developed this theology even further. I'm right now reading a book by Dr. Hartshorn called Omnipotence and Other Theological Mistakes. Don't you just love that? Doesn't that just sound like a Unitarian? He lists six mistakes, by the way. <laughs> anyway, process theology views humans and indeed everything in our world, in our universe, not as discrete, unchanging things, but as processes that are always becoming, experiences that are always unfolding and evolving, so to speak. In this way of viewing the world right now, in this moment, I'm not a being or a, dis a discrete object, but a series of events unfolding. My experiences from the past, the possibilities available to me in this moment, and the choices that I make of those possibilities. But even as you were listening to that, I made choices and became something new, and the Christ that spoke those prior sentences perished in that continual process of becoming, and so did you who heard it. Now, for process theology, the physical world is like this also. The cells in our bodies, the molecules, the atoms, the particles, and all things are themselves ever-changing processes, mixing, dividing, perishing, and being replaced. Buddhism has a similar concept called no self or no thing, which says that what we think of as the self is really an unfolding series of conscious experiences or events. There isn't an actual object there, just as the flame in our chalice appears to be a thing, but is in reality an ongoing process of fuel being burnt. Likewise, some Hindus hold that Brahman, the ultimate divine reality, is expressed through three gods, Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the maintainer, and Shiva, the destroyer. Again, all is ever-changing in this continuous cycle of creation, change over time, destruction, and new creation. Birth, life, death, 
new birth. In these worldviews, change is not something outside of ourselves, of our reality. It is the essence of reality. Our task then becomes to make the most wise choices we can from among the creative possibilities, the change that will come. And for some process relational thinkers, this is where we encounter the divine. Several times each week, I, I go to a park or a natural area and I take a meditative hike. It's a spiritual practice that I find particularly renewing. Sometimes, though certainly not every time, the meditation takes me into an experience that some psychologists would call a peak experience. It's what the first of our six Unitarian Universalist sources calls the direct experience of that transcending mystery and wonder affirmed in all cultures, which moves us to a renewal of the spirit and an openness to the forces which create and uphold life. Now these experiences are extremely difficult to describe in words. I'm gonna try though. A couple of summers ago, I went on a meditative hike at Mayfield Park. It's, it's one of my favorite natural areas, and I had my iPhone and my headphones so I could listen to some music that I find particularly beautiful and moving. At some point during the hike, I found myself simply standing in this beautiful, lush valley. There was a creek that ran through two limestone hills. I had no idea how long I had simply been standing there. Time seemed to have stood still or perhaps all times had somehow been put into that one moment. I felt somehow spread out connected with and a part of all of the beautiful life and creation around me. Paradoxically, standing there alone in the wilderness, it was as if I was interconnected in, in ways that are normally beyond understanding with all of humanity, with all of creation's continuous unfolding. These experiences, these glimpses of the enormity of that continuous unfolding of our universe, the ever-changing, always becoming nature of all creation. They can drive a sense of awe and humility that we are such a small part of it, and yet they can also bring that sense of spreading out, of ever-expanding connectedness, a sense that our own becoming is an integral part of the ultimate becoming. For me, they are also a reminder that change is how we know that we are living, that we are fully alive, both physically and spiritually. 